This is the introductory video for the Inelastic Collisions Experiment for Physics 1101-1120. There's two parts to this experiment. The first part is done on the air track, which you have seen before, and the second part is done on the rotational apparatus, which you have also seen before. Now we are studying an inelastic collision. That's a sticky collision where the two objects stick together. So one of our objects is going to be this red glider, and the other one is this gold glider, and they're going to collide together and they're equipped with Velcro, so they actually stick together. So we're going to be sending the red glider down the track, it'll pass through a photo gate, collide with the second glider, and then pass through a second photo gate. But there's a few things you're going to want to do before you start taking data. So the first thing you're going to want to do is level your air track. So you take your spirit level, and place it on the edge here, and then get the bubble as centered between the lines as you can. So you adjust the lab jack down here at this end of the track if you need to. So you get that as level as you can in the area where you're going to be taking data, so between the photo gates. But then you want to double check it. So this experiment is a little bit sensitive to any tilt in the track. So here's how you check it. Is it'll get a little noisy, but I'm going to turn on the air track, I'm going to start this glider from rest, and I'm just going to see that it doesn't head to one end of the track preferentially. So you always need to start it from rest, and you, what you should find is it either stays still when you let go of it, or maybe oscillates back and forth a little, but it doesn't head preferentially to one end of the track. So let me now demonstrate. I'll turn on the air track. I set the glider on the track and very carefully just adjust it so I release it from rest. And what I should find is that it doesn't really go anywhere. It may oscillate back and forth a little bit by say up to 20 centimeters, but it should just basically stay put after I release it if the track is level. The next thing you want to do is make sure that the photo gates are at the right level. So what I mean by that is we have this picket object on top of the red glider, and we want to make sure that the photo gate's going to be triggered by every single black line on here. So typical errors would be either that the photo gate's too high, it's not being triggered at all by the picket fence, or that it's a little bit too low and it's only being triggered three times for the longer stripes. So you want to run it very carefully through the photo gate and make sure that this red light on the top is coming on every single time one of those little black stripes goes through. Same thing for the other photo gate. Also be careful that you haven't got this just slightly tilted such that maybe the first seven or eight trigger the photo gate, but the last two maybe don't. So just check that, that every single black line is triggering both photo gates. The way in which the experiment's going to be done is that we are going to be colliding the red glider into a stationary gold glider. You do need the masses of both of these, so go ahead and weigh them. Weigh the red one with the picket fence in place and you want to adjust the position of your photo gates as follows. What we want is for the red glider to come along to pass completely through photo gate 1 before the collision happens, and then very soon after that hit the gold glider, and then pass through the second photo gate. And you'll get the best results if you actually have things set up such that the picket fence is right between the photo gates, but fairly snugly contained between them. So it completely passes through the first photo gate, then the collision happens with the gold glider, and then they travel off together through the second photo gate. So that actually means that the picket fence is going to be in between the photo gates like this, and the gold glider usually has to be sitting outside of the photo gates for that to occur. So once you've got that all set up, then you're ready to take data, and you're going to be using a program called MomentumImpulse.exe to take measurements on the velocity before and after the collision. So I'm going to show you on screen how to use the program, but first I'm going to do a trial run with this, just so you can see it. So as I mentioned, we want the picket fence to be between the photo gates when the collision takes place. That means I want my gold glider actually outside the photo gates. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the air track. I'm going to hold the gold glider in place until just before the collision to make sure that it's stationary. I'll give this guy a flick, send it down the track, and the collision will take place. You would obviously want the program running when this happens, so you would turn on the air track, have your partner start the program, hold the gold glider in place, give the red one a flick, let go, and let the collision take place. And you should strive to have a fairly gentle collision, so not too noisy, just because if the gliders bounce around a bit too much, you'll get extra friction on the track. So now I'll show you the program you use in this part of the experiment. 
So as usual, go to the v Photogate VIs, and we want to open up Momentum Impulse. So that looks like this. Now there's a few things you're going to need to change in the program. So they're over on this side here. Intervals to time is actually fine the way it is. There are 11 black stripes on your picket fence, and that means there's 10 intervals between the stripes, so 10 intervals is correct. The edge-to-edge -edge distance is from the leading edge of one black stripe to the leading edge of the next black stripe. Let me demonstrate. So you've got a picket fence with a bunch of black stripes on it. The edge-to-edge -edge distance that you need to measure is between the first edge of one black stripe to the first edge of the next black stripe. So that's roughly a centimeter, but you should measure it and think about what your uncertainty is. The edge-to-edge -edge distance gets entered here, and it should be converted into meters. So right now, this says 0.1 meters, 10 centimeters, that's way too big. So you measure your edge-to-edge -edge distance and enter that in meters here. And then you also need to input your two glider masses. To start the program, all you need to do is click the single white arrow as usual, wait for the little red button to turn green, and then start your experiment. So I'll do that now, but I'll spare you the noise. So now I'm back and I've got some data that I've taken. So first of all, notice that this little white arrow is gone. It's actually saying that the program's still running. If I didn't like this data and I wanted to do another run, I could click Cancel, and then the white arrow would come back and I could do another data session. However, you don't want to click this Cancel button until you've fully analyzed both of your graphs. So for now, I'm just going to leave this guy running. You'll notice that there are two lines on this graph. One of them's red, one of them's gold. That's for the red and the gold gliders. So this is a velocity time graph. Down here, the velocity of the gold glider before the collision is assumed to be zero, so it's right along zero. The first photo gate, however, measured the velocity of the red glider before the collision. So this red line is the velocity before the collision for the red glider, and down here is the velocity of them both together, so both the red and the gold glider stuck together. So we want to get these velocities before and after the collision to use in our calculations. To get them, we're going to use these cursors down here. So unfortunately, when I click this little white button, there's a little menu that pops up, and in the video you can't see this, but there is a screen capture of it in your lab manual. So go and have a look at that. You click the white button, and there is an option on the menu that says Bring to Center. And this may be a little hard to see also, but that brings a cursor to the middle, and you can then click the cursor and move it around on the screen. So what I'll do is I will put this right on top of the red glider's line before the collision, and that will allow me to then read off what the velocity of the red glider was, so this second one. I also want the velocity down here after the two gliders continued through the second photo gate. So again, I'm going to click the little white button here. That brings up a menu that unfortunately you cannot see in the video. And I say bring to center, and that gives me a cursor that I can then drag around, and I'll place that right after the collision. So that gives me the velocity before and after the collision for the red glider. And obviously after the collision, the red and the gold gliders are stuck together, so they have the same velocity. So these two numbers down here are the velocities that I'm going to want for my calculations. So you're going to print out this graph, and then by hand you should also write down what the velocities are and what their uncertainties are, and that's something you'll have to calculate. So let me outline how you do that. The program calculates the velocity based on d divided by t, where d is the edge-to-edge -edge distance on the picket fence, and t is the time for one interval. Now we don't actually have these t values, so how do you get the uncertainty on v if you don't know what t was? Well, you actually can do it. This down here would be the uncertainty formula that you would use to calculate the velocity's uncertainty, but you'll notice that this dt, the uncertainty on t, is just the uncertainty of a photogate. So coming down here, the uncertainty of the photogate's 1%, so that's 0.01 .01 times t, and then it's all divided by t, so the t's cancel out, and you would just have 0.01 .01 in the brackets here. So even though we don't know what t is, we only know what d is, we still can find an uncertainty on the velocity that the program gave us. So now we want to look at our momentum time graph. So down here there's a button that will allow you to switch between the two graphs. Something glitchy about the program that you need to be aware of is that there's this little double-headed arrow right in the center. If you click on the arrow, nothing happens, but if you click anywhere else on the button, it functions normally. So just be aware of that. So we click onto the momentum time graph, and now we want to get some values off of here the same way. Now theoretically, we expect the impulse of the two gliders 
to be equal and opposite. An impulse is just a change in momentum. And this is a momentum time graph. So what we expect is that the drop in the red glider's momentum should equal the rise in the gold glider's momentum. And it doesn't quite look that way on this graph because I didn't actually put in the correct masses. But that's what you should find, is that the drop in the red line should equal the rise in the gold line. So again, we want to get some numbers off of here. We're going to use the cursor. So I click the white button to get a menu that you cannot see in the video, unfortunately. Go bring to center. That gives me a cursor I can now drag around, and I'm going to put it on the initial momentum of the red glider, so just before the collision. I'll do the same for after the collision. I go bring to center, grab my cursor, and put it on the momentum right after the collision. And we assume the momentum of the gold glider was zero to begin with, so we just need to get momentum after the collision. So again, click on the third cursor, say bring to center, grab the third cursor, and put it on the gold line right after the collision. You are also going to want to print out this graph too, and you want to write your values by hand on the graph. Once you've gotten all your values, there are some questions in the lab manual that you want to make sure that you answer. Basically, they have to do with checking whether or not momentum was conserved during this collision, and whether the impulses were equal and opposite, as expected. So before I tell you about the next part of the experiment, I first want to warn you about something to look out for in your own data. So this is new data, and you'll notice that this line over here looks kind of sloped. This one does also, though that's a little harder to see. And this slopingness, this shows up in all of the graphs. So this line looks sloped, this line looks sloped. This is a symptom of your track not being level enough. So if you see either an upward slope or a downward slope in all of the horizontal sections of your graph, that means you should re-level your track and take your data again. So here's the apparatus that you're going to be using in the second part of the experiment. And there's a few things you need to do to prepare it for use as well. So first of all, as usual, you want to level the apparatus. So you put the spirit level on the base, look straight down, and make sure that the bubble is centered in the circle. If it's not, the bottoms of these legs are little screws that you can adjust to adjust the leveling of the entire apparatus. So level it as carefully as you can. Next, in order to use the computer program, we need a photogate on here. So you need to remove photogate 1 from your air track and attach it to the apparatus like so, such that the picket disc is going to trigger the photogate. Now in a previous experiment, you actually measured the moment of inertia of this apparatus and also another object, either a rectangular block that was oriented in different ways or a set of three different objects. You're going to be using those moment of inertia values you got from the previous experiment in this experiment too. So as you know, linear momentum is supposed to be conserved in a collision. Mass times velocity should be conserved before and after the collision. Same thing goes with rotational motion, except that it's angular momentum that is conserved. And that is equal to, instead of mass times velocity, moment of inertia times angular velocity. So you need the moment of inertia of this apparatus and of the accessory object you're going to use, and you already have those from a previous experiment. The program is going to give you the angular velocity. We're using a slightly different program for this part of the experiment. It's called Angular Momentum, but it looks a lot like the program you just saw. So I will show you how to use that program in just a moment on screen, but for now I'm going to show you how to use this apparatus. So the way in which you perform this part of the experiment is you're going to give the disk a spin, you'll reach over and start your program, and then very quickly after that point you want to drop the object onto the spindle. So you want to capture that collision on screen. So we had an object that was spinning, and another object that was not spinning. They collided, and then they continued to spin together. So it's very much like what you did in part A, where you had a glider in motion and one glider stationary. They collided, and then they continued moving together. Except this time, it's spinning motion rather than linear motion. If you used the rectangular block previously, then obviously you're going to be using that. And if you use the three accessory objects, you'll be using either the rectangular block or the disk. So now I'll show you the second program we use. Again, go into Photogate VIs. Before we used Momentum Impulse, now we want to use the program called Angular Momentum. So you open that up, and it looks a lot like the one you just saw. Again, there's some things here that you need to check. Intervals to time, it's set to 25. You could also set it to 30. This is probably fine the way it is. Another thing to check is that you want to get this edge-to-edge -edge angle in radians. So just as a reminder, 
Your picket disc has 10 of these black and white stripes. So 360 degrees divided by 10 gives you 36 degrees. The angle from the leading edge of one black stripe to the leading edge of the next black stripe would be 36 degrees converted into radians. So you go back into the program and check this number. Make sure that it's correct. Again, to take data, all you're going to need to do is click the white arrow and wait for this red button to turn green. If you want to retake data, you can hit cancel and then go back and click the white arrow again. So now I'll take some data and I'll show you what this looks like. Okay, here I am with some data and as before, the program I'm just going to leave running. If I wanted to retake my data, I could hit cancel. That would bring the white arrow back and then I could retake some data. But this is pretty good. So what we have here is that this level area up here is when it was just the platter spinning. And then I dropped the object onto it, and this is the object and the platter spinning together at a lower speed. So this downward drop is the collision point. Now what I want is the angular velocity before and after the collision, so I'm going to get those using my cursors as before. But before I talk about that, I first want to tell you about some glitchy sort of things you might see in your data. So one thing that you might see is actually here in my data, and that is that you can tell that I rubbed the spindle a little bit as I was dropping the object. So I didn't just get it directly on, it actually rubbed a little bit, and you can see the slowdown here. This is not too bad. I've still got a pretty level section up here, a pretty level section down here. If you've got a really gradual rollover, then you probably want to retake your data and try and drop the object onto the spindle without rubbing it so much. But if it looks like this, where it's pretty level, and then a fairly rapid drop off, and then fairly level at the other end, then this is probably okay for you to take data off of. Another glitch, which is really common, is that you'll see right after the collision, there's a big downward jagged spike, and then things level off. That downward jagged spike is because the picket disc slipped a little bit, but only for a moment. So if you see something like that, it's usually fine as well. You just make sure that you put your cursors on the level part down here, rather than the big downward spike that came just due to the picket disc slipping a little bit. So now let me show you how you get your data. Again, you click the white button. That will bring up a menu that unfortunately does not show in the video. You say bring to center, and then you can grab your cursor and move it around. And you want to put it on the level area just before the collision. And then you would do the same thing to get the angular momentum after the collision. You should bring it down to the level area and put your cursor right there. And then these two numbers are your angular velocities before and after the collision. And that's what you're going to use in your calculations. As before, you should print this graph out, and then by hand, write down your angular velocities before and after, with uncertainties that you will have to calculate, and units. Once you've got these values, you're going to use the moment of inertia values you got in a previous experiment to calculate the angular momentum before and after the collision, and then you'll be able to say whether those two numbers agree within their limits of uncertainty. That is to say, whether angular momentum was conserved.